Hello, welcome to Clinical Physiotherapy MCQ series. Here we will be discussing day to day physiotherapy clinical scenarios with explanation. Let's move to our first question. A 72 year old patient reports bilateral calf pain experienced while walking. The pain has gradually increasing after an insidious onset two years ago. Sitting decreases the patient's symptoms and patient's past medical history is significant for smoking and diabetes. Which of the following pathologies is most likely the cause of patient's leg pain? Option A. Lumbar stenosis Option B. Gluteal artery collocation Option C. Herniated nucleus pulposis Option D. Deep vein thrombosis And the answer is Option A. Lumbar stenosis Explanation of this question is Lumbar stenosis by definition causes lower extremity symptoms with extension activities and stenosis is more common in an older population. Gluteal artery claudication would cause buttocks pain, not calf pain. This patient is relatively too old for herniated nucleus purposes. Most herniated nucleus purposes do not cause bilateral symptoms. Nothing given in the patient's history would increase the likelihood of the deep vein thrombosis. Now let's move to our second question. A 24-year-old patient reports to physical therapy with a diagnosis of fracture to the right humerus. He informs you that the fracture occurred at the mid-shaft of the humerus as a result of falling down a flight of stairs. Given this information, which of the following nerve would likely to be damaged secondary to this injury? Option A. Median nerve. Option B. Subscapular nerve. Option C. Deltoid. Option D. Radial nerve. And the answer is Option D. Radial nerve. Explanation of this question is since the patient has stated that he had a fracture to the mid shaft of the humerus, the radial nerve, which is the largest branch of the brachial plexus, would most likely to be injured because it passes through the radial groove next to the bone. This occurs on posterior aspect of the humerus. Now let's move to our third question. A 55-year-old patient with a cerebellar stroke has received functional balance training for 4 weeks. Which of the following test is most appropriate to measure the effectiveness of the physical therapy intervention? Option A. Romberg's test. Option B. Berg balance test. Option C. Fugal Meyers assessment. Option D. Barthel index. And the answer is Option B. Berg balance scale. Explanation to this question is Although Romberg test is a measure of the role of vision in the balance, it alone would not be most appropriate measure for the functional balance. The Berg balance scale is an objective measure of static and dynamic balance abilities and consists of 14 commonly performed functional tasks. Therefore, it is the most appropriate tool to measure the innovation effectiveness. The fugal Meyers assessment is appropriate for cortical stroke and would not be most appropriate for cerebellar stroke. It is not as comprehensive in balance tasks as Berg balance scale. The Bethel index is more global instrument and is not as focused on functional balance as the Berg balance scale. Now let's move to our fourth question. A physical therapist is working with 40-year-old patient who had an open repair of rotator cuff two weeks ago. The patient requests a transfer to another facility to continue physical therapy. Which of the following measures should the patient expect to have achieved at this time? Option A. Active shoulder abduction to 30 degree. Option B. Fire supraspinal test strength. Option C. Passive shoulder flexion to 60 degree. Option D. Full passive range of motion. And the answer is... Option C. Passive shoulder flexion to 60 degree. Explanation to this question is Active range of motion is not allowed until approximately 6 weeks. Supraspinatus strength testing is not allowed due to the active range of motion restriction. After open surgical repair of the rotator cuff, passive range of motion is not allowed tolerance generally around 100 degree of elevation. Full range of motion would not be achieved by this time. The cuff is still protected from stresses. Now let's move to our fifth question. A client of weight loss program has been walking 3 days per week for 15 minutes. 
for the past three weeks to progress the exercise program which of the following is most likely accomplish the weight loss goal option a maintain the current walking speed and increase the duration to 30 minutes option b increase the walking speed and keep the duration at 15 minutes option c walk four days per week and decrease the duration to 10 minutes option d change from walking three days per week to jogging one day per week for 20 minutes and the answer is Option A, maintain the current walking speed and increase the duration to 30 minutes. Explanation to this question is, the optimal exercise duration for achieving a weight loss with a walking program is 40 to 60 minutes of continuous aerobic activity. Therefore, once a patient is safely tolerating 15 minutes, the best progression is to increase the duration while maintaining the same intensity or walking speed. Increasing the walking speed should not only be performed once the patient can constantly tolerate 20 to 30 minutes of exercise. Decreasing the duration while increasing the frequency of exercise would not accomplish the goal of 40 to 60 minutes of continuous exercise. A patient who has been walking for only 15 minutes 3 times per week would not be ready to begin jogging and jogging 1 times per week would be too low exercise frequency in general to achieve any training benefit. So that's all for today. If you need further clarification, check the description box and give your feedback in the comment box. If you like this MC session, do subscribe to this channel for more videos. Thank you.